So if you guys watched my video about the Origin PC Millennium, uh, I talked about the fact that 12th gen, no matter what you install it in, whether or not it's fully water-cooled, custom loop like this, or an AIO, gets extremely hot. Well, I'm using this as my desktop here now at work instead of using the small one, so I figured I'd take this opportunity to kind of do some undervolting with 12th gen, because I feel like that's something that a lot of people take advantage of with Intel's latest generation and its voltage and heat and power draw. So I want to see, because this is the first full water-cooled loop that I have my hands on for 12th gen, how much will undervolting actually help in terms of trying to keep these temperatures under control. Bring your setup to the next level with Cable Mod's all new custom coiled keyboard cables. Available in a variety of colors and connector types utilizing best in class connectors, the keyboard cables give your setup a look and feel it deserves. To see the complete lineup of custom keyboard cables available from Cable Mod, click the link in the description below. So this is the first MSI board I've really kind of gone in and played around with the BIOS on 12th gen. So I'm not, as familiar with this BIOS layout, so I'll be kind of figuring out what features it has available to it. We've been using ASUS uh, for a while now in our builds, so I'm very familiar with that BIOS. We did update the BIOS though, because our build was all the way back to November, which is not that far after 12th gen launch, so uh, I updated for maximum memory compatibility and all of that. So I haven't actually even turned on XMP profile, which I went ahead and did right there. And let's just go ahead and do a boot, a restart with XMP to see if that will even start. Now, one of the things with 12th gen is because they've got E core and P core, we've noticed uh, not just a massive amount of power draw um, and heat generation from this chip. I mean, 250 plus watts under load in Cinebench is a lot of heat for a block to manage. It's not the loop. There's more than enough thermal capacity in the 2360s to keep 250 watts cool. It's just when you have 250 watts really like condensed into a, a really kind of like small area, which is that of the CPU die, um, it generates a lot of heat. Now, as we move forward, someone might say, well, Jay, GPUs like 3080 Ti here is much smaller and much denser than the CPU, yet it gets into like the low 50s under load. Why does the CPU get so much hotter? Well, that's direct die contact. We have the block touching the die directly, whereas the CPU has to go through a heat spreader and then into the block. As also, if you compare the surface area of a GPU block versus that of a CPU block, they're much more thermal capacity in a GPU block than a CPU block. So it might get to the point to where we need bigger, thicker CPU blocks to keep them cool just by having more thermal capacity. But it's the transfer rate between the die and the CPU block that is being interfered with with the integrated heat spreader, the IHS. So I just want to give a little background there as to why that is. If there's one thing I understand very well, it's cooling, which is why I now I have to get in here and do voltage mods to try and keep the cooling a little bit more under control. So let's just take a look at the settings here real quick. And this isn't a tutorial. I'm just kind of showing you the methodology I go through. So we're going to go to OC. All the voltage stuff, at least for MSI, is under OC. We're in expert mode because it's access to everything. We're not touching any of the core frequency stuff. We're not doing any of the like core enhancement stuff like you would see in ASUS. This is just out of the box settings for MSI. So if I go to all the way down here to voltage, right here, core voltage mode is just set to auto. This one gives us kind of a few options here. We have adaptive mode, which is basically what auto is gonna be, which means it will determine under the load conditions and the frequency at which the CPU is going to, how much voltage does it think it needs to give to the CPU. Spoiler alert, it will always err on the side of more voltage because that's more voltage means more stability. The problem is that also means more heat and it also means more um, you know, power draw out of the CPU, which kind of exacerbates the problem. It starts to get too hot, then it starts to drop the clocks to bring it down because the voltage is just pumped into the CPU to make sure it's as stable as possible. It's kind of like in a car. Most cars err on the side of running rich rather than lean to, a calcu to calculate for all of the different altitudes at which cars operate. So like if you're in Denver, your car runs very different than it would here in California when we're at nearly sea level versus a mile in the air, which is what Denver is. So with that said, I need to get a baseline. So I'm just gonna go ahead and boot the system here with stock settings with my XMP enabled and we need to get some baselines. Now we've already done that with our uh, overview of the system. It was reaching upper 80s and I think the hottest I saw it get while letting it just loop and loop and loop is like 91C on the CPU. 91C is still, what, 14C below where we would start the throttle, which is 105C. I, with, the, with two 360s and a big old loop like this and tons of fans and airflow and a 5000T, that is still much warmer than I would ever expect it to get to. And again, that has everything to do with um, 
the, the voltage logic built into the motherboard. So as always, I'm using Cinebench R23 for my um, temperature testing because I can let that loop. This is the toughest scenario which a system of mine will ever, like my, none of my systems will ever get hotter than doing Cinebench R23. I've got hardware monitor open here to, volt to keep an eye on different voltages and temperatures. So vid is the voltage to each core directly. You've got CPU core temperature, which I don't care about. I care about the core temps, which are right here. And as you can see, they're in the 20s. And then we've got CPU here under voltages, which is gonna be basically like the V-core voltage. It's just when they name it something different. So CPU, not V-core. So as you can see right now, under idle conditions, it's about 1.272. And then our voltages to our cores are bouncing around between like 1.25 and 1.33, it appears. Um, and then I'm just gonna start this test and see where we sort of land. The initial spiked temperatures will give me an indication of what things are looking like here. So we are in the upper 60s, low 70s on the E cores. We are already at nearly 90 C on the P cores, 85, 76 on core one. And it's 1.315 volts to the cores. To do that, our, volt, our core speeds right now are 4.9 all-core P-core and 3.7 all-core E-core. These temps are not bad, but I fully expect that they could be better. Since we're spiking up to the high 80s, that tells me over time, with full saturation of this loop, we would probably end up hitting 91, 92 C on the core. Uh, P-cores, package temp, there's a lot of different areas where it will take temperature readings to determine what it's going to do. You've got the package temperature, which is just the, the socket temp itself, the entire array, if you will. Individual E-core, P-core temps, as well as system agent, like all, voltages. All these things come into play. 1.336, in my opinion, based on stock speeds and what I've already done on like my, um, my, my small build when I was undervolting that, is way more than I think we need. I'm also not planning on doing any real overclocking with this. I might push it to like a 5.0 all core, maybe even a 5.1 all core, because I found that I can undervolt it and still overclock it and get fairly decent results out of it. So yeah, 1.33 to 1.35 is where it tends to be going. Package temps at 88. Core temps, the hottest core is hitting 89. I'm not gonna change clocks first. I'm gonna actually change voltage. And I could do this with uh, Intel XTU. In fact, I'm gonna do that because Intel XTU or Extreme Tuning Utility um, will allow me to do this in the operating system where I can make quick changes and run the test over and over. And then when I sort of get that dialed in, if I want, I can go into the BIOS on a BIOS level and have dial or like enter in these figures and these numbers to where I don't have to worry about XTU running to make all this work. Another benefit to using XTU is the fact that you could leave all your BIOS settings stock. That way you know it'll boot. And then when XTU runs, which is be set up to automatically start with the system, it can then imply the under voltage and any clock adjustments that you've made, memory speed adjustments. That way you know you get a safe boot and then let XTU handle all of it. XTU is very similar to how like Ryzen Master works, um, only it's a lot more like utilitarian, whereas Ryzen Master is a very gooey kind of an interface. XTU is just like, here's all the settings and all the dials, good luck. In fact, another benefit to XTU is the fact that it's smart enough to know when it crashes. For instance, when you shut down the system, you shut down and XTU shuts down normally, uh, the log will basically say that it had a successful shutdown. If you lock up under testing conditions and you have to force a restart, when XTU starts back up and sees that it did not have a successful shutdown in the log, it will not apply your latest overclocks. It'll tell you what the defaults are and say, do you want to load these defaults? It looks like your system was not stable, which makes it a lot easier process to figure out your overclocks and or your undervolts without doing it in the BIOS level and having to deal with a clear CMOS every single time and then put all your um, memory settings and your fan speeds and your boot priorities and all that stuff back. So XTU is actually a very powerful program uh, when applied you know, correctly. It's got a built-in speed optimizer, which I don't want to do because I want to do advanced tuning, which is going to be uh, under volting here. So core voltage offset, we can do a negative offset to our voltage, or we can do core voltage here as just a fixed value. Now I wanna do a fixed value because I don't want, the offset is only gonna to apply to whatever its dynamic adjustment is. I don't want that. I just wanna lock the voltage where I can see in static voltage situation with a very hard test, where does it crash? Now I know that 1.33 is running by default. 
I'm gonna go ahead and just do 1.3 and then I've applied that. I'm also gonna max out our turbo power timer window. I want everything as static as possible. So already we've uh, come down a couple of degrees. It's just, this reminds me of like the 4770K where you have certain cores that are just fine. Like we've got core two right here, core one sitting at 74C. And then we've got a core right next to it doing 85. Like this is why delitting became a thing because of the fact that there was such uneven thermal compound between the IHS and the die, or the IHS itself sometimes was kind of wavy or concaved or bowed, which was causing certain cores to run hotter than others, especially if you have a hot core right next to a cool one. This is the frustrating thing here is to see like, like I said, core one is at 77, 74, 76, right next to a core doing 86. 10 C difference. Now 4770K, we saw like 14 C delta between the hottest and the coldest. But those were usually like on two different sides of the die, not right next to each other. See, so our CPU right now is showing 1.28 volts. And then if I look at vid, it's still going 1.35 per core. So you can see how just package core or, or, or CPU core voltage or V-core and vid are two very different numbers when it comes to voltages. Um, temperature wise though, again, we've hit 90C on the package, we've hit 90C on core two, which is our hottest and core seven. So I'm gonna drop the voltage even farther to 1.25. All right, here we go, let's try this again. One, does it run and not crash by dropping the voltage that low? Okay, so vid is back up to 1.35 by setting it to static. And we're at 96C on the core. So clearly that setting didn't help at all right there. What we did find is by setting it to static and then having it like, I had to go way farther south of where I wanted it to be to actually have it land where I wanted it to be. So let's go to 1.2 and let's see if 1.2 puts us where um, we expected the voltage to land, which is right now 1.25. It's exactly 0.1 volts higher than where we're setting it. Uh, it's, it's weird the way it does that, but now we can at least sort of dial in based on that. I kind of go in like 50 millivolt adjustments typically until I'm doing fine tuning. Like if it were to crash now, then I would know I can land somewhere between 1.2 and 1.165 and then go from there. So there's our vid 1.254. Look at our package, 78. 80. Our E cores are back down into the 60s. It's really getting the wattage down is what's hold, helping the temperatures. And obviously the wattage is based on amps and volts, right? So it's working. And the fact that it hasn't crashed is already a good sign. So if that doesn't tell you already that we was doing 1.36 volts on vid and we're at 1.26 volts on vid and it's still stable, like it didn't crash immediately. That's already a good indicator. So I'm gonna go 1.15. Interestingly enough, our overclocking thermo uh, thermometer, <laughs> ther thermomelocity ther boost, <laughs> thermomelocity boost. <laughs> it was disabled by default, which is interesting because this is a this is like a prime, uh, ever since like 10th gen and up, this has been a very big deal. Um, we re-enabled it here. I wanna see what the difference is. So it's 1.40 on the vid, 77 on the package, 78. The core one, which is like our amazing core, is at 68 degrees right now. <laughs> we can get them all that cold. I don't want to delid one of these CPUs. I have like four of them. I could have a sacrificial, but folks have already been delitting these for, for obvious reasons. And it's just why, why can't Intel do, do this itself? So like our max temp right now is 80 on the package. Our hottest core hit 80. And sure, I'm not running this for like 30 minutes. That'll be the last thing I do is, okay, I think I'm dialed in. Let's let it loop and see if it crashes over time. If it crashes over time, then I'd have to slowly add back like 10 millivolts. If the fluid rises 1C, the temperatures will rise 1C. They rise one to one ratio. So it's one of those things where we have to let the loop get to full warmth to determine where the CPU's temperature is going to land at as well. But right now this is looking very promising. 78 on the package, 78 on the cores, 76. See, ASIC quality is gonna determine how much voltage it needs to maintain its clocks, right? If we have a very leaky CPU, it'll tend to take a lot more voltage to maintain the, the clock that's expected to run. If we have a very tight CPU, I, I, I refer to it as leaky voltage or tight in terms of, of crosstalk and such and the ASIC quality, this CPU is already starting to look like it's one that's going to benefit very well from low voltage and not need to be, you know, stupid ridiculous. 
So I'm gonna go 1.125, I've now reduced it 25 millivolts, not 50, because I know I can't keep going 50. It's, it's just not gonna happen. So at 1.125, the CPU voltage is landing at 1.188, and then our vid is 1.220-ish. It every now and then spiked though, as you can see, 1.339, and that's right when the test starts. And this is gonna have a lot to do with our droop settings as well, which I haven't touched. They're OEM droop. Droop says how much will the voltage sag under load versus it applying more offset to keep a ma like maintain a level voltage. Because our vid is going higher than my target, I'm not messing with, volt with droop, I'm leaving it where it's at. But that would kind of be like the next step, is okay, you sort of dialed in now, let's play with droop and see if how level we can get the voltage to land under load. Because what will happen is this, the test will start and then the voltage will spike real high and then come back down. Um, the same thing can happen when we stop the test is it could shoot down, which can also lead to a crash situation. It'll shoot down and then come back up. It's those spikes and those droops or drops that determine your stability at the start and stop of a test. But right now these temps, 76 on the package. Our hottest core is hitting 78. And core one, which is our amazing core, is at 68 right now. It was at, now at 66, 67. I'm kind of surprised that it, I can still lower this voltage. 1.1? See, I would consider this a golden sample right now if I can maintain stock clocks by dropping the voltage now almost 225 millivolts. That's a lot. That's a huge percentage drop in terms of voltage, which as you can see is having an immediate indicate, like impact on our temperatures. I've said this since the moment we first started touching 12th gen. How much voltage are they adding that you just don't need? Motherboard manufacturers say, the voltage is only going to what the CPU is commanding. But I can take the same CPU and put it in different motherboards and have completely different voltages. So clearly the motherboard also has a say in the voltages. 73 on the package. Now I've been running this test over and over and over, obviously, not letting the loop cool down. So by stopping, adjusting, and starting again, it's, it's a lot more toward the equilibrium. Now our vid is finally under 1.2. It's like 1.9s, 1.19, 1.19, 1.189. This is absolutely beautiful. And my fans are also not running as loud because the CPU is not as hot, which could also have an indication of the fact that, hey, if I left the fan static, which would be the next logical thing, is you lock everything down so you control the variables as much as possible. If I left my fan static and then tested temperatures, that would give me an indication of what the effects of the voltages are doing. But if the fans are slowing down because the CPU is colder, that could also lead to a warmer temp over time because you have the fan curve adjusting. So I'm not locking the fans though because it's water-cooled. It has a lot less of an effect than say an air-cooled system would. But that's something you'd want to do as well. If you truly are trying to dial in voltages and tests and temperatures and remove as many variables as possible, you would absolutely want to lock your fans off. So I'm gonna go 1.08 volts. So I'm only dropping at 20 millivolts now, not even 25. So one of the things I'm gonna want to do here too is once I find out where my voltage is stable, I'm gonna go back to default, adaptive with an offset, a negative offset. The reason for this right now is this is working fine at idle and then hitting it with a load. When you start loading programs and stuff where the voltages or the, the clock speed can suddenly spike in a single core or dual core type of scenario where only one or two cores are being hit, this voltage might be too low for that, which could then lead to instability. So that's why I'll just find where the negative offset puts it to this under load and then under adaptive, that will allow it to adjust its voltages as it needs to as programs kind of come on and off offline and are hitting the core in a very different way. Right now I'm dialing instability in a very specific test but this is the load test that I'm dialing in for, and then I'll adjust from there. So core voltage right now is at 1.168. Vid is at 1.175 or so. It's funny because it does, it, when, I, when I start the test and I watch it load, the voltage does hit 1.33 and then come down. So that tells me, even though I have it set to static on here, it's still doing adaptive voltage adjustments, which is probably why it's not crashing when we start the test. It probably would have crashed if it wasn't doing that adaptive thing. So I'm not sure what setting in this motherboard is causing that to still spike like it is. Um, it could be honestly the fact that the motherboard itself still sees an adaptive voltage setting, whereas XTU is telling it, no, let's go static. It's almost like the motherboard handles it for a second and then XTU takes over, which is almost just, I'm fine with that, to be honest. The temperatures though right now, the core, the package got 78 for a second. That was during that load like that peak voltage, we're at 70C on the package. Our hottest core is 71, but they're averaging 60s now. 
and it hasn't crashed yet. That's the crazy part. It's like, to me, this should have crashed a long time ago. Like, let's go 1.065, I'll drop it at 15. Yeah, 70s and 60s now in all the cores. Package is at 68 degrees, 70, 69. It is, now if I stop the test, there's one other, there's one thing I wanna do right now. I don't wanna keep dropping the voltages. I honestly don't, cause I don't, I think we're gonna definitely get in too low territory. But let's just do random like loading of programs now. So I'm going to, I fully expect the voltage to like momentarily spike. Um, yeah, see vid is bouncing around like it should. 1.2, 1 1.3. So I should be able to start a program like let's say OBS Studio. Yeah, that's fine. Let's let it, let's just start recording. I mean, this is on GPU, but look, look, 1.35. Oh yeah, it's hitting CPU right now. And I can tell because look, we're having some cores 1.404, 1.3, 1 1.4. So it is dynamically adjusting like it should. Okay, let's try CPU test in 3D Mark. People would see the temps like in the most recent video we did about this and they'd say, wow, that loop really sucks. And it's like, no, actually the loop is like doing its job. Because mm -hmm. if you've ever tried to put even just like a basic AIO on 12th gen and just leave it alone, it's like, it reminds me of like the 9900K. Let me tell you what's nuts about this. This 12th gen right now, which is not overclocked, this CPU test in Time Spy Extreme is measured in milliseconds. It's as fast as like when we were doing the 9980XE on LN2 and the 7980 XE on LN2 back when the 20 series first launched and we were doing like crazy overclocking with that. It's nuts that this is that fast without overclocking it at all. Okay, so there you go. Um, I'll do one more thing before we get out of here, which is I'm just gonna bump all the clocks up 100 megahertz to see if that's because if, if it crashes under that condition at this voltage, then I'll know like, okay, I was already getting towards the edge right there. But I have a feeling it may not. One active performance core, I can make that 5.3. But I'm just bumping all this up one click. So now we're looking for 5.0 all core. And the nice thing is if this crashes and I restart the program, it'll just tell me like, hey, do you want to go back to defaults? And then I'll know I just have to put it back to static increase my turbo, turbo timer, and then just go back to the 1.17 is what the voltage was, or maybe it was 1.16. Ah, see, do you see how just 100 megahertz, even at idle was like, nope. So yeah, you'll find sometimes too, to get that extra 100 megahertz offset, might take a lot of voltage. It's weird the way that works. Like you can just, at stock voltage, just add frequency, add frequency, add frequency, and then you'll find this one number this one frequency where it's just like, nope, no matter how much voltage you add, no matter how much offset you try and do or cooling you throw at it. Well, I, I shouldn't say cooling you throw at it because LN2 obviously makes that number go up. But it gets to the point, hey, look, the BIOS actually recognized it. Um, we'll load default values and continue. Yeah, so once you get it all dialed in where you're comfortable, you can save the profile in XTU, and then you can just have that, that profile be what uh, automatically loads once XTU loads with the system. So there you go, undervolting, still a necessity, which is funny because th this was such an AMD thing for the longest time. Now it's an uh, Intel thing. And the watts too dropped to under 200 watts. We went from over 244 to 250 watts under load to under 200, which is still a lot, okay? It's still a lot because AMD's like 5950X still hits like 130, 130, 140. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. I hope this helps someone like, oh my goodness, my 12th gen's been super hot. Now I can maybe keep it cooler. You can do this with any cooler, any cooler. In fact, I recommend you do it if you're running air cooling or a small AIO, absolutely. So, all right guys, thanks for watching. What were your results like? Have you undervolted your 12th gen? Heck, have you undervolted any of your CPUs? What was the result? And uh, how is it working out for you? There's XTU loading. Let's see what it has to say. I'm sure it's gonna come back and be like, bro, you broke it. Yep, see, there it is right there. The application exited unexpectedly. This may be due to platform instability. So anyway, we can continue. Advanced tuning. I agree, because it's telling you you're gonna break your stuff. And as you can see, I have to put all this back to like where I had it now, which I'm gonna go ahead and do. Again, I'm just not gonna take you guys along for the ride. All right, thanks for watching. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you're new and share this video with someone that's complaining about their CPU temps. It very well may help them. We'll see you in the next one.